This is part two of chapter 19 of Pride and Prejudice. Mr. Collins has just proposed to Elizabeth and she's about to respond to his proposal. It was absolutely necessary to interrupt him now. You are too hasty, sir, she cried. You forget that I have made no answer. Let me do it without further loss of time. Accept my thanks for the compliment you are paying me. I am very sensible of the honor of your proposals, but it is impossible for me to do otherwise than decline them. So Elizabeth says, thank you very much. I know that you're doing a very generous thing and that it is an honor for me to receive your proposal, but I have to say no. I am not now to learn, replied Mr. Collins with a formal wave of the hand, that it is usual with young ladies to reject the addresses of the man whom they secretly mean to accept when he first applies for their favor and that sometimes the refusal is repeated a second or even a third time. I am, therefore, by no means discouraged by what you have just said, and shall hope to lead you to the altar ere long. So Mr. Collins says, oh, don't worry. I know that ladies say no once, twice, maybe even three times when they're being proposed to, but I am still determined. Upon my word, sir, cried Elizabeth, your hope is rather an extraordinary one after my declaration. I do assure you that I am not one of those young ladies, if such young ladies there are, who are so daring as to risk their happiness on the chance of being asked a second time. I am perfectly serious in my refusal. You could not make me happy, and I am convinced that I am the last woman in the world who would make you so. Nay, were your friend Lady Catherine to know me, I am persuaded she would find me in every respect ill-qualified for the situation. So Elizabeth says, believe me, I am sincere. When I say no, I'm not one of those ladies who's going to risk being happy and married just to be asked again if there are even such people in the world. I wouldn't make you happy. You wouldn't make me happy. I don't think Lady Catherine de Burr would approve of me either. Were it certain that Lady Catherine would think so, said Mr. Collins very gravely, but I cannot imagine that her ladyship would at all disapprove of you. And you may be certain that when I have the honor of seeing her again, I shall speak in the highest terms of your modesty, economy, and other amiable qualifications. Well, then he uses the word qualification as if this is just a job interview, just a position as Mr. Collins's wife. Indeed, Mr. Collins, all praise of me will be unnecessary. You must give me leave to judge for myself and pay me the compliment of believing what I say. I wish you very happy and very rich, and by refusing your hand, do all in my power to prevent your being otherwise. In making me the offer, you must have satisfied the delicacy of your feelings with regard to my family, and may take possession of Longbourn Estate whenever it falls, without any self-reproach. This matter may be considered, therefore, as finally settled. So she basically says, do not feel guilty about taking Longbourn. You've, you've done your duty by trying to marry one of us. Um, and she's also trying to be very nice about how she says no. So she says, I would like you to be happy, and I do not think I will make you happy. And rising as she thus spoke, she would have quitted the room had not Mr. Collins thus addressed her. When I do myself the honor of speaking to you next on the subject, I shall hope to receive a more favorable answer than you have now given me, though I am far from accusing you of cruelty at present, because I know it to be the established custom of your sex to reject a man on the first application, and perhaps you have even now said as much to encourage my suit as would be consistent with the true delicacy of the female character. So he's still going to ask her again, and he's still convinced that she's just saying no out of modesty and out of being a fashionable lady. Really, Mr. Collins, cried Elizabeth, with some warmth, you puzzle me exceedingly. If what I have hitherto said can appear to you in the form of encouragement, I know not how to express my refusal in such a way as may convince you of its being one. So she says, listen, if you took what I just said as encouragement, I don't know how to tell you no then. I'm out of strategies. You must give me leave to flatter myself, my dear cousin, that your refusal of my addresses are merely words of course. My reasons for believing it are briefly these. It does not appear to me that my hand is unworthy your acceptance or that the establishment I can offer would be any other than highly desirable. My situation in life, my connections, connections with the family of de Burr and my relationship to your own are circumstances highly in my favor. And you should take it into further consideration that, in spite of your manifold attractions, it is by no means certain that another offer of marriage may ever be made you. 
Your portion is unhappily so small that it will in all likelihood undo the effects of your loveliness and amiable qualifications. As I must therefore conclude that you are not serious in your rejection of me, I shall choose to attribute it to your wish of increasing my love by suspense according to the usual practice of elegant females. He still doesn't believe that she doesn't want to marry him, and he says, these are my reasons for believing in another very thesis-like organized fashion says I, there's no reason why I'm unworthy of marrying you um and it, there's no reason why the house and the life I could give you would be bad and also I'm connected with Lady Catherine de Bar, in case you haven't heard and also we're related and then I could you know fix the whole me taking Longbourn thing and also even though you're pretty and charming and all that, you're gonna be really poor, so there's no guarantee that any other man ever will ever ask you to marry him. Ever. So that's, that's pretty insulting now, as polite as Elizabeth is attempting to be. I do assure you, sir, that I have no pretensions whatever to that kind of elegance which consists in tormenting a respectable man. I would rather be paid the compliment of being believed sincere. I thank you again and again for the honor you have done me in your proposals, but to accept them is absolutely impossible. My feelings in every respect forbid it. Can I speak plainer? Do not consider me now as an elegant female intending to plague you, but as a rational creature speaking the truth from her heart. So she's saying I'm sincerely I'm rejecting you, Believe me, pay me the compliment of believing what I say to you and taking my words seriously. You are uniformly charming, cried he, with an air of awkward gallantry. And I am persuaded that, when sanctioned by the express authority of both your excellent parents, my proposals will not fail of being acceptable. He's still convinced, and he says maybe once your parents both approve, you'll be on board. To such perseverance and willful, willful self-deception, <laughs> self Elizabeth would make no reply, and immediately and in silence withdrew, determined that if he persisted in considering her repeated refusals as flattering encouragement, to apply to her father, whose negative might be uttered in such a manner as must be decisive, and whose behavior at least could not be mistaken for the affection and coquetry of an elegant female. So Elizabeth just withdraws leaves and says let him ask my dad because he will say no and then he will very clearly know that this is definitely a refusal my dad is not an elegant female trying to just you know toy with his emotions so that is chapter 19